Today's sermon is entitled, Peace on Earth. My name is Reverend Derek Geller. I'm the pastor here at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I turned on my TV set, and I go to CNN, and I watch some of the news each morning. I get out my coffee, and I get my brand cereal, and I just sit back and relax, and, and I just slowly eat my breakfast, and I watch TV. I've noticed that lately there's been an awful lot of wars around this world. I look at it, and you know, Russia's at war with Ukraine, and now I look at Israel's at war with Hamas, and I look at all the various different countries now that are basically saying, we would like to go to war too. I don't know if they really like to, but they want to, or they feel like they must. I'm not sure what it is, but they're all talking about each other and saying, you know what, we might get involved in this war or these collection of wars too. And I got thinking, is there any peace on this earth? You know what? The Bible talks about this. It says during the end times, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And I got thinking, maybe we're getting closer to the end times. Now, it does say in the Bible, nobody knows the day or hour when the Christ will return. That certainly is true. Not even Christ knows. Only God the Father in heaven knows when he will return. But I got thinking, you know what? There's an awful lot of unrest in this world. And it's not just wars that create unrest. I live in North America. I'm truly blessed to be here because we don't have wars that are raging in our lands. But the truth is, is that there's a lack of peace here too as well. There are people with financial problems that are looking at their, their bank account and they're saying, where am I going to get the money to basically feed myself? Where am I going to get the money to pay for, for my electricity or for the oil bills that are about to come or, or, or? Or how am I going to get peace within my family, within the relationships of the people that I have? I got some really bad, broken relationships, and maybe you're fighting with your spouse and you're saying, how am I ever going to get peace with my spouse? Or maybe at work, you're in turmoil because, you know, maybe your job is not secure, or maybe you haven't got as far in your career that you'd really like to, and you're sitting back saying, I'm getting thrown under the bus daily in a whole bunch of office politics. The truth is, it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of peace on this earth, does there? And we tend to be filled as human beings, I think, with an awful lot of anxiety. There's a passage in the Bible that I really like. It's one of my, my most favorite passages. It's in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 that says, you know, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your request to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you having your heart and mind basically covered by the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he giving you peace despite your circumstances? Maybe they're really rough this morning. Maybe you don't have a lot of peace in your life, but is the Lord holding on to you? Are you allowing him to put his hands around you and give you comfort in the storms? You know what? Peace is not easy to obtain. And there are many ways that we seek that peace in the first place. We look at goals. We search out dreams. Things that we think that if we do in our lives will make our lives a little bit better. You know what? If you don't have a goal, then how do you know that you've actually gotten to where you want to go? Well, you don't know because you need the goal to get there. And I got thinking about all the different goals that we can set and priorities in our life. Part of those goals, the setting of those goals, is to produce happiness, contentment, and peace within our lives. People set all sorts of different goals when it relates to anxiety, reducing that anxiety and making their lives a lot better. And I got thinking some of those goals relate to personal goals. And I think these really go a long ways to reducing anxiety, such as getting in good shape. That's not a very easy task, is it? We know every single one of us, I think we know anyway, you've heard it at least once or twice, if not many times in your life, that whatever you do in your 40s determines how you feel in your 50s. And how much you do in your 50s determines what you feel like in your 60s and so on. We know that getting in good shape is absolutely imperative. We know we should eat the right foods and we should exercise daily. We know that's certainly true. And we know that affects the way not only that we think, our minds, but also affects our bodies and everything about our lives. Maybe one of your goals to reduce anxiety in your life is to get really in good shape so you don't have to worry about maybe some health concerns. For other people, it's to eliminate a bad habit. Maybe you've got some habit right now that you say, I'm not very happy with the habit that I have. You know what? The truth is, is that maybe you're a smoker and you're saying, I'm getting an awful lot of money over to the government and taxes, but more importantly, I'm wrecking my health. And I know that. And I've seen all the ads and I see the warning on the cigarette package that says this can cause cancer and most likely will. And, and I've been ignoring all of them and I just want to get rid of this bad habit. Maybe your bad habit is something completely different. Maybe you gossip a lot and you're sitting back saying, I want to get rid of that habit. I know gossiping is wrong. The Bible tells me so. I want to get rid of it. I want to stop gossiping to people. Not an easy task if you're addicted to it. 
Or maybe you sit back and I say, I got a really bad habit. I like to just lay around and do nothing. I'm an incredibly lazy person. And I don't have any goals and I don't have any dreams. And I really would like to do more in society, but I'm just too lazy to do so. Maybe you want to get rid of the bad habit of doing nothing. Or maybe it's getting out of debt. Maybe you're sitting back saying, I got so much debt. And I'm paying so much interest to the various credit card companies that I'm just absolutely drowning. And by the time I pay the interest, I got no money left for myself. And maybe you're sitting back saying, a lot of my anxiety would be reduced if I just had a favorable bank account. Maybe you want to get rid of all your debt. So you can sit back and say, then when I have something that's really tough, a bill that comes up they didn't expect, I'll be able to pay it without the anxiety. We have all sorts of different personal goals to reduce anxiety and to get peace in our lives. But for some people, it's not so much about the personal goals. It's more about relationship goals because they know within their relationships they're experiencing an incredible amount of stress. For instance, for a lot of people, it's spend more time with the family. I know that's one that I always wrestle with. I'm bivocational. It's hard for me to find time to spend with my family. I have to carve out time and protect that time at, at absolutely all costs. I got to say, you know what? This is a time I'm spending with my family, regardless of what might come about. I got to spend time with my family. I want to spend more time with them. Maybe you're saying to yourself, you know what? I'd like to go on walks. I'd like to go for picnics. I'd like to go for boat rides. I'd like to take trips with my family. I'd like to just spend time talking to with my children, giving them advice, telling them, here's some of the pitfalls I did in my life. Maybe you might want to try to avoid them. I'd like to be a, a very best friend to my children and to my wife or to my husband. You know what? The truth is, is that relationships matter, especially when it comes to family. Maybe you're sitting back saying, I've heard the adage, you know, spend quality time with your family. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I've read an awful lot of articles that say we should spend both quality and quantity time with our families because the two go kind of hand in hand. Maybe that's an area that you struggle with and it's producing anxiety because you know your relationships in your family are not great. Maybe it's not so much your family, but maybe it's a broken relationship that you're really thinking about. This is producing a lot of anxiety in your heart. I read a book, I think it's called The Love Languages, and, and it was to, basically for me to, to help work with me, to train me how to basically go through marriage counseling, how to sit down with couples and say, they'd ask me, uh, we want you to marry us. Oh, okay. And I offer the marriage counseling. And I got thinking this book was a really good um, book to offer to the couples and we could walk through it to figure out how do you really express your love towards each other? And part of the book says we have what is called a love bank. And this love bank basically is, is a bank where you put good compliments and you do good deeds to the other person. And every time that you do that, you put a little bit more love in the love bank. Once that love bank gets full, of course, you just keep putting more in the love bank. And that's okay if it overflows. That's a good thing. And then someday, and it's going to happen, and it always does, when you do something stupid, which we all do in our relationships, then you can pull from that love bank and the relationship stays intact and doesn't get destroyed because you did something really foolish. Well, you might have some relationships where that love bank is completely blank, empty. It's got nothing in it whatsoever. You've done a whole bunch of bad things in the relationship, and you know it. And as a result, there's no love in the love bank, and you're struggling with that other individual. It's creating great anxiety in your life because you want a relationship with them, but you pretty much, through your past action, have destroyed it. For a lot of people, if they want peace in their life, they want to fix those broken relationships. Maybe it's just helping other people. Maybe it's not about you at all. Maybe you feel like if your life is going to matter for anything whatsoever, then you want to make sure that you're out helping other people who are in need. There's a lot to be said about that. You know what? Our integrity, our sense of purpose, our desire to help every, everybody else that's around us is real. It should be. In Philippians, you know, Paul talks about this at the Church of Philippi. He says, you know what? You're supposed to consider others better than yourself. Look out for their interests first above even that of your own. And maybe that's something that you're struggling with. But while we work through our, our personal goals and our relationship goals to try to get more peace in our life, I think the number one thing that we have to work through, of course, in conjunction with these is, is, is God. We've got to work on our relationship with the Lord. We've got to look at him and say, here I am, Lord, mold me and shape me. Now, here's the thing. His love bank for us is full. He loves us, everlasting love. He couldn't love us any more today than he did yesterday. He loves us. Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And he loves us with an undying love. 
It's always the same regardless of the way we treat him. He will always love us completely, fully, and beyond anything we could ever imagine. Our relationship with him, though, depends on us, how we respond to him, how we allow him to cultivate a good relationship in our life. We've got to sit back and say, Lord, I see your hand being held out and you're saying, come on, come a little closer to me. If you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you, it says in the Bible and James. But you know what? The reality is sometimes we don't draw near to him, do we? And as a result of that, we miss out on that beautiful love relationship we have with God the Father in heaven, our creator. And one of the things you might be sitting back saying, I want to get to know God better. I want to know my Lord better, so much more. Well, read the Bible. It's God's love letter to you. He explains to you exactly what you must do to be holy. It says in the Bible, be holy as God is holy in First Peter. So we got to sit back and say, you know what? This is great. I know what I must do. Why? Because I got a love letter from God, but sometimes we don't read it. I don't read it near enough, not near what I should, and I know that, and I'll confess that openly. I want to read God's Word more. I would love to be the point where I meditate on God's Word day and night like the psalmist did. I struggle with that, and I know everybody does. But the truth is, is that if you want a good relationship with the Lord, you got to read that love letter and allow him, as you can see in the picture, allow the Holy Spirit to wrap his arms all around you and to show you the way, the truth, and the life. It says in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is the truth. He says, you know, he is the spirit of truth. And as a result of that, he knows the difference between right and wrong. And he knows the best pathway to get to God and say, here I am, mold me and shape me. He knows what that is in your life. He knows what God wants for you individually. God has all sorts of different expectations for each and every one of us. You know what? We're not all, we're all created in his image that way the same, but we're all given different spiritual gifts and we have different roles inside of his kingdom. So as we read God's word, one of the goals is is to ask the Holy Spirit, hold on to me, change me, mold me, shape me, tell me exactly what God the Father in heaven, my blessed Father wants from me, and give me the courage to step out and do it. Maybe that's one of your goals. Maybe another one of your goals is just, to pray to God daily, to spend time talking to him. I got thinking, oh my goodness, we have 24-7 full access to God the Father in heaven. It says, boldly approach my throne of grace. Boldly do it. You can at any time, God the Father says, anytime talk to me, spend time with me. We can talk to the, the Holy Spirit. We can talk to Jesus anytime that we want. Anytime, two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning. Can you imagine having a really big life crisis or even a really small one and calling up somebody, one of your friends at three in the morning? Can you imagine how they'd respond? They say, could you not have waited until I got up? They're going to sit back and say, really? And if it was petty, they would certainly say, whoa, this is a petty issue. But to God, nothing's petty to him. And he's always available for us. He is always open. His doors are always open for us to talk to him. And we've got to spend more time with him if we want to be like him. I've had a few people ask me, why do you, Pastor, why don't you drive more? Most times when you see me and my wife in the car, pretty much every time, she is driving, my wife is, and I'm in the passenger side. That's a little bit unusual. A lot of guys like to drive, don't they? They like to, you know, I want to be the one driving the car. I'm the opposite. I like to be in the passenger seat. That's where I'm most comfortable. And a lot of people ask, is that because you're not a good driver? And I have to admit it. If it's sunny out, if it's a beautiful sunny day, if it's warm and the skies are all blue, I'm not a very good driver. I like to daydream. I like to think of a lot of different things. And as a result of that, sometimes I'm not as attentive as I should be. And I have to force myself to look at the road, keep my eyes on the road, and to focus on where I'm going. I have to do that all the time. Other people, that just comes natural. But for me, I have to really work at it. But they say, okay, is there any time, Pastor, you're ever a good driver? My wife will speak up and say, yes, in the midst of a storm, you won't get anybody who drives any better. Uh, The truth is, is that when I have to pay attention, I do. And I very much so do. I remember I went to a funeral. I was officiating the funeral. And we really shouldn't have had the funeral that day. And the family basically said, we're caught in a conundrum. We have a whole people out of state that are here for this day and this day only for the funeral. We know the weather's really bad. But we want to have the funeral because they got to leave tomorrow. And they're going to miss the funeral. We want to have it today. 
Of course, the funeral home tried to talk them out of it. They said, it's really dangerous. You sure you want to do that? And they said, absolutely, this is what we want. So they had the funeral. At the first part of the funeral, it wasn't too bad. It was, it was snowing out, but not very much. And it was nothing that you would ever even think about. You sit back and say, okay, we're safe. We're okay. Halfway through the funeral, though, it started to pick up. And we started thinking, ah, we're not as okay as we used to be. And, of course, I'm in a sanctuary where it's got windows on both sides of the sanctuary. And as the funeral's going on, people can look out the window. And they did and realized they were in peril. By the time the funeral actually finished and I was allowed to leave because everybody else left and I talked to everybody, the storm was raging beyond all control. I couldn't see five feet in front of me. And if you look in the picture, that's roughly what I saw. And the only way that I could get home is to look up at the power lines and follow the power lines and say, if I'm following the power line, I should still be on the road. But I can tell you what I really did above that and what was much more helpful, I prayed to God, Lord, please help me get home. Please help me to drive the right way. Please help me to pay attention. Please help me to stay on this road and make it home safely. And I did. And I tell people, I'm only a good driver because the Lord carries me. You know what? We need the Lord to carry us through prayer because there's so many circumstances in our life that are not very peaceful at all. They produce incredible anxiety because we don't have the solutions to the problems in life, do we? There are many things that we face in life that we don't have any way to handling whatsoever. And it scares us. It petrifies us, especially when we don't know what the future looks like. And I can tell you, boy, it make a difference. It really makes a difference when we ask God the Father in heaven, please help me and show me the way. Here's the wonderful part about this sermon, though. I've read and, and I have many different books, and they all seem to point to the same thing. And, and if the days kind of throw you a little bit, they could be off a day or two. But basically, to form a habit, it takes a, approximately, we'll say, 66 days. Let's make it easy. Two months. Two months, roughly, and you can form a brand new habit. So the things that I've been talking about to get rid of anxiety, whether it be personal goals, relationship goals, whether it be praying to God more or reading the Bible more or maybe feeding the poor, whatever your goal might be, that can be formed in approximately two months. And if you're listening to this sermon at the time that I actually recorded it, I'm still sitting in October, you have time between now and the end of the year to have a whole bunch new goals, new dreams, new New parts of your life. You know, once a habit is formed, they say after the 66 days, you repeat it over and over and over again for 66 days. It becomes part of who you are. You don't have to think about it anymore. You just do it. You just go. And, and, and isn't that beautiful? So is it possible to be holy? Yes, of course it is. Is it possible to clean up our relationship goals? Yes. Is it possible to take care of some personal goals and to spend more time with Jesus and to be molded and shaped by him and make that part of our lives? Yes, it's absolutely possible, but it does take effort on our part. So the question is, why don't we do it? When the Bible says, you know, be holy as God is holy, why aren't we all holy then? If it's that simple, all I got to do is take on a few goals every year and I can become more like Jesus. And within my lifetime, I can see some radical differences. Why don't we? Let's look at some of the excuses. Excuse number one. And I think this is one of our favorite excuses. I know it's one that I often point to. Just too busy. I'm too busy to do any more. I'm too busy to establish a new habit or a new goal or a new dream. It might be, for instance, in picture number one, you might say, I'm too busy in my life and what little time I have, I spend it with my family. I want to spend more family time. Back to the first goal that we talked about. You know what? Maybe that's your focus. And for some people, they don't go to church. They stay at home so they can spend time with their families. Well, why not come to church and spend time with your family and God's family all at the same time? A lot of people won't do that. Maybe it's shopping. I remember, and I'm getting older in the tooth, I guess, so to speak. I'm starting to get up there. I remember when they first allowed Sunday shopping. And I remember at first, there were very few people who actually went to the stores. And, and I kind of sat back and said, why would you bother? Why would you have those big stores open? All the expense and overheads that go with it on a day when very few people are going to come out. It wasn't very long, though. A few months later on, everybody was shopping. In this picture, you can see there's only one lady going down the aisle. Later on, there's multiple people going down the aisles because they love shopping on Sunday. And maybe you sit back and a lot of people do say, I'm not going to go to church or I'm not going to read my Bible or I'm not going to pray or I'm not going to carve out any time on Sunday for the Lord. Why? Because I'm too busy shopping. Or maybe it's the next picture. Maybe it's cleaning. I know a fellow at work uh, specifically that says, you know what, I carve out Saturday and often most likely Sunday as a day to clean the house. 
And I don't go to church because, you know what, I, I have no desire to go because he, he doesn't believe in the Lord. But at the same time, he says, I wouldn't anyway because that's my time to clean the house. Or maybe it's meetings. Maybe you are so filled with meetings and you run so hard during the week and you're so tired. And you finally made it to the finish line for the week. And when Sunday morning comes, all you want to do is sleep in. Or maybe it's leisure. A lot of people don't go to church because they're too busy with leisure activities. I know of, of all sorts of couples that go and take off to their cottage on, on the weekend. And they don't go to church because they're at their cottage and they're enjoying their leisure time. Maybe you want to go for a walk. Maybe you want to go to the park. Maybe you want to go to a picnic. And Sunday just seems like the right day to do it. Sunday morning, off you're gone. Or maybe, and this is the number one reason, is sports. Maybe your children are in basketball, volleyball, soccer, football. Maybe it's some musical instrument or musical recitals or some other kind of event that pulls you away. The truth is, is that we are busy and we think we're like the energizer bunny during the week. I can do anything. I can do all things. I can accomplish anything and we load up the whole week and then we forget about God. And as a result of that, we don't form any really good habits for the Lord. What does it say in the Bible about this? It says, the one who received the seed that fell amongst the thorn is a man who hears the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it out and make it completely unfruitful. Matthew 13, 22. Now, this verse specifically is talking about the parable of the seeds. And what it's saying is, is that the concerns of this world is one of the reasons why people don't get saved. They hear about the Lord Jesus Christ, but as a result of the worries of this world, the concerns of wealth, and all the things that they are chasing, things that are priorities for them, that are not God-related, as a result of that, they never, ever come near to Jesus. Now, this verse wasn't written specifically on, on, on time spent alone with God or on busyness, but it does still apply, though. The truth is many people, even when they get born again, choose to be babies in Christ, according to Apostle Paul. And Peter said the same thing. You are like babes in Christ. They never grow because the concerns of this world keep them away from the Lord. They still fully haven't surrendered their hearts to the Lord, which they should have done when they got saved. And they did when they got saved, but now they've forgotten about that and they've become what the next picture would probably arguably say. They've become incredible lazy. And maybe that's your excuse number two. I just don't care. I just don't want to form new habits. I'm not interested in any of that. A.W. Tozer, a famous, he was a Pentecostal theologian, and he basically said this, complacency is the number one enemy of spiritual growth. In other words, the desire to do nothing in life is the number one reason why Christians don't grow. I don't want to try to read my Bible more. I don't want to pray more. I don't want to feed the poor more. I don't want to serve in God's kingdom more. Why? Because I'm lazy. I just want to sit on my couch and watch TV. Have you ever had that experience? Lots of people do. They sit back and say, you know what? Why do I need to do anything? Once saved, always saved. I don't have to worry about my salvation anymore. Now that I'm saved, all I got to do is ah, relax on my couch and I'm going to heaven. All is good. But what does the Bible say about that? Is the Bible in favor of that? No, because faith without deeds is dead, James says. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe there's but one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. James is making a very profound point here. The point is that when we got saved, we had to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is not just belief that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith is saying, Lord, take my life. I believe you atone for my sins. I believe you're the only way I'm getting to heaven, but take my life and let it be. I give you my life fully and completely in your hands. James is saying the demons believe very much that Jesus is the Son of God. They were one of the only ones that did believe in the New Testament. They were the ones that said, Jesus, Jesus, this is not the appointed time. Surely you didn't come to destroy us. We know who you are. They were one of the very few that knew the identity of the Lord. Others would say you are the Son of God, but then later on they wouldn't fully realize it, would they? The disciples, for instance, they toyed with the idea of Jesus' identity, but it wasn't until after the cross that they fully understood who he was. And, and I think that, you know, in our lives, when we say yes as Christians, we got to have faith. we got to have faith that Jesus is the Son of God. And not only that, we've got to give our heart to him. That's the, the component that is missing there. The Pharisees knew God, but wouldn't surrender to God. So they were like whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones and all things unclean, according to Scripture. We have to give our heart to him, which means faith must be accompanied by deeds. In other words, we've got to live for Jesus. That's how we got saved. We said, Lord, I want to live for you. I believe in you. 
and I want to live for you. Take my heart. Take my heart and let it be. This is what we need to do. And I got thinking, you know what? There is only, only, only a couple of months left before the end of the year. But there's enough time to establish a whole bunch of new patterns in our lives and to get that peace that we've always been looking for. Cast all of your anxieties upon the Lord. But that casting of our anxieties upon the Lord also requires us with faith, I think, to actually want to do something, to live for him, in faith, to take bold steps and to get closer to him. And you might say, you know what? I'm not really sure if I can do that. I'm not really sure if I'm capable. And I got thinking, of course you are. You know what? It doesn't take very many steps in life to make a profound difference. I think sometimes we think to ourselves, you know what, I got to make, if I'm going to be a good person, if I'm going to be a born again believer that really I'm proud of, if I'm going to mature in the faith, then I've got to make radical changes and differences in my life all at once. But that's not necessarily true. I think it's the small steps that we take one after the other that leads us closer to the Lord. It's like this picture that you have here of a canyon. When it started out, this canyon did not exist. It was just one great big mountain. And then this water, this stream went over top of the mountain and over many hundreds of years, of course, the water cut eventually, even though water's very soft and you don't think about it being powerful, yet it is. And it cut all the way through and made canyons on both sides. It made a gully, a ravine. I think the same is true in our lives. We've got to surrender our hearts piece by piece to the Lord. We've got to say, look, Lord, I can't take these big giant leaps necessarily all at once, but I can certainly take baby steps. And all those baby steps, those new habits that you're helping me form, they're going to make a profound impact upon my life. This is where we got to go. And I think truthfully, time is ultimately running out. It says in Genesis 3.19, very first part of the Bible, you know, you just barely get in the Bible and you find out that humankind sins against God. And you find out the punishment of that. You know, ever since God said, dust you are, dust you return, that's our punishment for the sins going against God. And, and in Hebrews, it says, all humans are destined to die once. In other words, our lives are incredibly short and time is running out. You don't have an abundance of time. And the older you get, the more you realize that. When you're young, you think you've got all the time in the world, which I suppose in some cases you kind of do. you got several different years. you got decades yet ahead of you. You don't think so much about time. But as you get older, you start thinking, I don't have a whole lot of time left. If I'm going to make changes, i got to do it now. And there are significant results of ignoring God. I got thinking about all the wars in this world because people have ignored that God wants us to get along with one another. We're not supposed to hate each other. We're not supposed to hate those people, according to scriptures, that are created in God's image, which we all are. And you've got genocides of 300,000 or 800,000 people that die just because they can't get along with each other, because they don't like each other. They don't like the look of the other person, or they don't like their culture, or they don't like their words, or they don't like their behaviors. And this is not good for society. And it says in Romans 8, uh, 20 to 21, it says, the whole world's in a bondage of decay, waiting for the return of the Lord. We don't want to ignore God because there's significant results will happen in our lives. We will not get closer to him if we ignore him. There will always be bondage of decay. There will always be wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, diseases. You know, we just went through, you know, the coronavirus. Oh, my goodness. That was absolutely horrible. And we just went through that. So we know that there's significant things that are going to happen in our lives that are going to be very tough to get through. We need the Lord in order to get through them and feel peace. I think excuse number three why we really don't want to form new habits is because of defeatism. A father named uh, Augustine, he was a famous theologian. He said this, And whoever doesn't believe his sins or her sins can be forgiven, worsens in desperation, as if nothing better remained to them than, than, you know, the faith in your conversion. To sit back and say, once you get converted, I got nothing else I need to do, is defeatism. To say, I cannot change because I don't have the power, I don't have the ability, I don't have the time, I, I'm just too busy. That's defeatism. That's where the devil wants to get us. You know what? I'm a strong believer that the devil will fight as hard as he can to keep you from saying yes to the Lord. He will make sure before you get saved that you stay unsaved as long as you possibly can keep you there. He will keep you there through various different means. He will give you money. He will give you power. He will get you chasing after anything but God. And as long as you're chasing after anything else, he's okay with that. He doesn't want you chasing after God. 
But the second you say yes to Jesus and you become born again, what now does he want in your life? Well, he's lost the battle for your soul, but what he wants is you to stay lukewarm. He wants you to stay as a baby in Christ. He wants you to sit in the pews and do absolutely nothing. He wants you to feel that you are defeated, that you will not accomplish anything in God's kingdom whatsoever, nor could you ever do so. If he can get you to that point, you become a laissez-faire Christian. You become a Christian that's like a sleeping giant. You're capable of almost anything and everything, I would argue, that God asks you to do, but you're not willing to do any of it. This is called defeatism when we think we can't do what God asks us to do. But Christ is not dead. He lives very much so. How much more then will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God cleanse our consciousness, our acts that lead to death? How much more will he cleanse us and enable us to serve? Hebrews 9.14. Think about that just for a moment. Let those that verse sink in. Uh, the truth is, is that I sin against God. And if the requirement for me to be a pastor was not to sin, then I wouldn't be a pastor. That's just truth. I sin probably every day. I'm pretty sure I do. I, I, I know I sin at least once every couple of days. Absolutely. I'm always asking him to forgive me. And sometimes I sit back and say, Lord, why do you really want me to be a pastor? Look at all the sins that I do in my life. But the truth is, is that's not what the Lord's looking for. He's not looking for us to be sinless, albeit he would love us to be that. Don't get me wrong. He doesn't want us to sin. But the truth is, is what he wants us to do is be righteous, which means the second we sin, we ask for forgiveness of sins. We don't get into a defeatist attitude where we say, I can never be holy. I can never be righteous. You certainly can because you're not slaves to sin anymore, any more than I am. He wants us to form new habits, to get rid of the sin in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, and to form new habits that are seeking his kingdom and serving within his kingdom. And is that all possible? Absolutely. Can we stop sinning, by the way? Yes. Can I stop sinning? Can I make it so I never sin ever again? Probably not, no, because I'm still human. But can I ask the Lord, you know, help me to become more like you, and will he mold me and shape me and get me more like him? Yes. Absolutely. It's a given. It, it, the word of God tells us, yes, he will cleanse you from all those things that lead to death. And he will enable you to serve him. The Lord will cleanse you, enable you to serve him. What more do you need to serve him? What more requirement do you need than the Lord actually being for you? And I got thinking, ultimately, grace is given to all individuals that are out there. For the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men and women. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are able to say no to sin. So while I say I sin every day, that's my fault. That's That's me. I have to go before the Lord in prayer every day, and I try to, and say, you know what, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for the times in which maybe uh, there's a day that I, I say something bad about somebody and I shouldn't. Forgive me for the times I covet what other people have. Forgive me, Lord, for the sins that I have in my life, because I've done them. I've chosen to do them. Because through the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ's death on the cross, I have the ability to say no to sin and not do it. But here's the wonderful part. When I ask for forgiveness for sins, which I do, Jesus cleansed me from all unrighteousness and enables me to live a self-controlled life. And what the verse means by that, a righteous life, a life that is holy and gracious unto our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm enabled to do that. And I'm working every day, striving to get closer to him. So again, I ask you the question, what are your goals for next year? What are you focusing on? Are you ready? Like now's the time to set your goals because you've got exactly roughly two months before the end of the year. You've got time to set really good goals and they don't have to be massive. It might be, I want to read God's holy word a little bit longer. I want to make sure every day I spend a half an hour in God's holy word. That may seem like just a small little thing to you, but that will plow furrows of righteousness in your heart that will be absolutely staggering over your lifetime. Or maybe it's, I want to pray to you, God. Maybe it's every time that I go and I meet with somebody for my relationship, one of them that is broken or certainly strained, and my love bank is very low with that person. Maybe it's prayer. Maybe you say, Lord, every time I meet that person, may I pray before I meet them. 
and ask you that I would show grace to them and I would love them. I would see in them exactly what you saw in me when you died on the cross. And you saw the same thing in them, a sinner that is saved by grace through faith. And, and Lord, help me to feel that way. Help me to see their potential. May I love them like you do, Lord, with everlasting love. Maybe it's it's just something that you sit back and say, you know what? When I go through difficult times or I have financial problems or marital problems, I rely on you 100%, Lord, to help me through it. You know, these are the habits that can be formed. And they only take just little small baby steps, but they make a profound impact upon our lives. So if you want to feel peace, you get peace from the Lord. If you want to feel tranquility in your life, you get that from the Lord. I'm not saying even for a moment that the wars are going to disappear because you pray more or you read the Bible more or you've taken care of personal or relationship issues. I'm not saying that at all. The truth is, is that we are in a world that's in the bondage of decay and will remain that way till the Lord returns. So there's going to be bad things happen for the rest of your life. Yes, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars. There's going to be disease, pestilence. There's going to be financial problems in your life, marital problems. But the key to feeling peace is to rely on Jesus. So who are you relying on? You know what? I think we should spend far more time looking at our lives and examining it. Like King David, we should be saying, search my heart, O Lord, and you find any sin in me. Please help me to ask for forgiveness. Give me the strength and the courage to say I don't want to do it anymore. Give me the strength and the courage, Lord, that when you clean part of my soul, some, some sin that is habitual that I've been doing over and over again, give me the strength and courage, Lord, to fill that with something for you instead of for the devil. You know what? These are things that we need to do. And it may not seem like very much. Maybe your goal is really small at the first. But I can tell you those goals, as they add up over your lifetime, will be staggering. And this is what the Lord wants us to do. Take the baby steps. Don't stay as a baby in Christ as Paul and, and Peter both define us. When we first get saved, we're like babes in Christ. Don't stay that way all your life. Many Christians do. I would argue probably most do. They stay as babes in Christ. They never grow. Don't be like that. Look for ways to grow in the Lord every day of your life. And here's the wonderful part. And here's where you're guaranteed success. And I love this part. I mean, you can set goals in your life. And a lot of people do, especially at the end of the year. And it doesn't take very long and you break all those goals. New Year's resolutions, they call them. How long do they last? It's not like that. What the Bible is saying is that when you set a goal and you ask the Lord to help you, then it's a given. The Lord will give you the strength, the ability, and the power to actually fall through or go through and make that goal, not just a goal anymore, but part of your life. And that is an amen. So I want to encourage you, please look at, please examine your hearts and find the areas the Lord wants you to grow. Even if they're small baby steps, take those steps now. So by 2024, the very first part of the year, you're going to say, I've changed some. may not be huge, but I can see a significant difference because the Lord helped me do it. So I pray that for you today. May God bless you today. Amen.